Welcome back, guys. You're with the Market Sniper. I've got a good one for you. Uh, in fact, uh, it's more a collection of thoughts that I've been putting together from a variety of research that I've been doing uh, over the course of the last week, 10 days. It also includes a, a bit of watching other people and other analysts. So we had Martin Armstrong on our YouTube channel. Please remember to click on the links uh, below, check through the videos to find the interview with Martin. Um, interesting. Uh, we've also been watching a bit of Druckenmiller, uh, who's come out to been a bit more high profile recently. A couple of people, uh, events that he's been talking at. And I'm going to give you some thoughts on some of the things he said or didn't really say almost in, in terms of market direction and, and a summary in my express opinion of where he stands and how to handle um, analysts' opinion, including my own. Uh, and then there was a very interesting Zero Hedge article. Um, immediately caught the eye, uh, the initial headline uh, barking about AI leading eventually to UBI, uh, so that's artificial intelligence, and the replacement of work that goes with that, that leads eventually to a lot of the middle income jobs, particularly in tech, for example, um, and other areas that see the sort of 100k a year, 250k a year salaries uh, disappear and get a lot more fulfillment through automation. Uh, we are in a mini boom so far, maybe to go a lot higher, I think, in terms of AI in the markets. And we'll be talking about exactly that, the booms, the bubbles. In fact, we're going to, uh, this particular article gave me uh, a chart that had historical bubbles in that, and that was particularly interesting to me. And I worked my way through this and I decided my personal framing on this, what was missing, what needed to be said, what isn't, uh, didn't need to be said, had, uh, gave, gave a lot of those views to my community around uh, a few days ago uh, and presented them again to uh, a closed group uh, recently. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating to see the bubbles since the Falker era, the late 70s, that started actually uh, allegedly with gold. I will argue, of course, that that was not a bubble in gold. It was a bubble in the dollar for which gold was highlighting the, uh, the fiat's weakness. Uh, but we'll be referring to that diagram as well. But on top of all of this, inside this video, I am going to be talking about this polarization event. The polarization event I stood on the hill 2017, we'll show you that YouTube again, I've referred to it a couple of times before, but said people do not realize that there is going to be a hollowing out the middle, uh, what's well, already happening, it's not, it's not prediction, it's already happening, but it's going to accelerate to the extremes that you're actually going to have two kinds of human being almost. Uh, and I've actually named uh, them now the opulence class uh, and the grand serfdom and peasantry uh, for the rest of us in many instances and how you need to stay on the right side of the fence to not be dropped down into the grand peasantry for which the UBI and all the other larger global Bolshevik uh, communistic tendencies are likely to overlord on top of you. In short, there is a priestly class, uh, a class that uh, transcends the rule of law uh, and then there will be the rest. Uh, and there will be also similarly divisors by wealth. Now they won't be exactly the same. You could be very wealthy but still subject to uh, find it hard to get around <laughs> rules of law and vice versa. You might not be the extremely wealthiest but you might be an insider uh, and get around certain aspects of the loss of freedom and control. But let's not get lost in the weeds. So if you're going to, this is probably going to be one of your most enjoyable videos. I think you're going to enjoy it. There's lots of diagrams to have a look at. We'll be going past Bono, no less. A figure of popular culture. Yes, we'll be highlighting how he got promoted into the opulence class by selling out his soul. To, not to rock and roll, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, we'll cover a little bit of that as well. So let's just first start right at the beginning. Um, so this was the video, as I say, 2017. The 9% or fail with the 91%. Be the 9% or fail with the 91%. By the way, that just happens to be our community's core focus. Wealth building in reset times. The first link in the description below. Click it, book a call, have a chat, make a time. Costs absolutely nothing. Decide if you like the people. Of course, don't forget to subscribe and hit always for updates. So from that video, we were talking about the ever-growing extremity. Uh, that is the hollowing out of the middle. Uh, and if most of you watching this, may, you know, 80% male, 
85. Love my uh, female audience, by the way. Wish there were more of you. Um, but to you, I salute you, by the way. So, you know, we get, we get the audience we deserve uh, at the end of the day. But if you are in the middle class income group, as I expect, you might be upper, slightly lower, you might be early doors in your 20s, but, you know, degreed and smart, you might be later in your 50s uh, and have a reasonable amount of balance sheet behind you. Every single one of you needs to watch what's coming because it's not just about building wealth, it's preserving what you already have. This is a seminal event where there are going to be earthquakes that could be absolutely shattering to your current balance sheets and actually if played correctly could have the dichotomy of actually being exceedingly useful and incredibly wealth enhancing and to be on the wrong side when that goes down could be one of the most costly critical errors you make okay so what's the article where did this all start um how does this lead also into um martin armstrong chats and uh watching stanley druck and miller well we're going to try to tie this all over for you. So get your coffee, sit down and enjoy this. So Hartnett, very popular on Zero Head, Bank of America um, analyst. AI equals universal basic income. Now that's something we've been saying for quite an extended period, that the whole globe is going to be right-sized, I fear, not only just in population uh, numbers, but overall everything. So the need for labor initially the world was led by the need for labor and resources and then there was the priestly classes of uh, up above and then there was capitalism the entrepreneurs uh, that sometimes were of the priestly class sometimes not that were bringing together the forces of capital and labor as you remove the need for individual human beings to do certain work so you have people more and more people that will be structurally unemployed and will need some degree of sustenance. Where? Wait for it. The state comes in to look after you. That's right. Uh, always there to protect, to protect you, you understand, uh, and to look after you. And for that, the catchment net would be universal basic income. I actually see this actually dovetailing right across into covering pensions that are going to be decimated. We'll talk about bond, bonds and debt markets in a bit. Um, and he's also pointing to the Fed yield curve control to fund bigger deficits. By the way, I will be referring to Japan and what's gone on in the USD tenure and what the biggest trade that nobody's talking about uh, that we've been chatting about in the community for a while. Guys have been getting trade entries on. You could also be doing these things. You could be getting the news before. You may agree, you may disagree, um, but you'll find out more in the subsequent video. So field yield, uh, Fed yield curve control, of course, that's already happening to some degree everywhere. But it's, it's happening to an extortionate level in Japan, and we'll be covering that. But first, let's get into the weeds of this particular article and the favorite charts. So there's two key things that came out for the article. This was the history of bubbles. Now, I've gone and done uh, cuts for you uh, so that they're a little bit bigger in a snagit that is showing you the artificial intelligence baby bubble so far for now, which is really just this light blue line that you're going to see over here very current up to here now it would be quite reasonable to expect this to go quite a lot further quite a lot further in my opinion and by the way for many um, i can just also highlight that actually the stock market the smp largely would be down by uh, reference of this article by the way if you want to watch this or read this Zero Hedge article, we will put it in the notes below. Go and grab it and take your time. Watch what I've got to say first. Go and refer more fully later. But the market would actually be down this year so far. Uh, instead of being the better part of, I think it's almost 23% up, it would be 4 or 5% down. Go and check the numbers for yourself. It's in the meat of the article. So the AI effect, although very small, is quite substantial. Um, how Hartnett has chosen to uh, highlight that AI effect, a um, little bit uh, narrow. It kind of obviously includes Microsoft uh, being added to uh, NVIDIA. One would think that part of Google's performance also with ChatGBT should be included. So I don't know if that's a perfect proxy, uh, but you know, nitpick away if you choose. But there is a feeling that there is the beginning, the seed beginnings of an AI boom that is taking a foot. But stop. Let's go back and look at the whole history of bubbles. Let's start our analysis right here. 
So here we go. In the late 70s, don't forget Vietnam War, mid 60s into the early 70s, uh, Nixon uh, then in 1971, closing the convertibility of dollar notes for gold for American uh, citizens. The nation states of France and everybody else continuing to withdraw gold given the blanket bombing of Vietnam uh, War, the absolute militarization to the nth degree. Uh, and this was just incredible spend. It served the military industrial complex very, very well. Um, reminds us of where we are now, actually, with military industrial complex shares at super highs. Uh, but during that time, that was a period of stagflation. It was awful for retail. It was awful for consumers. Inflation was high, growth was low. There was rubbish in the streets of New York. There were pushers everywhere. I remember the era through the eyes of my older brothers uh, and the inflation hit us globally, including uh, where I was growing up. Now you'll note that on the gold bubble, gold only partially retraced. You'll see that many of these other bubbles they've retraced right the way, round chippers, you've got Japan round chipping all the way back. So you had the, the Nikkei that ran 38,900, uh, round tripped all the way back down to the lows of 8,000, even lower than it probably when it started its run. You had the general Asia bull, uh, which ended in the 96, 97, 98 uh, stroke Asian crisis, actually ending worse off. That was during the period where um, Thailand's, I think it was Thailand's premier, could have been Indonesia's, referred to the likes of George Soros as locusts. That's right, locusts, George Soros, of course, behind the banking, uh, the breaking of the Bank of England, and also considered to be playing a very active hand in the shorting of the Asian markets. There was also that period of long-term capital where they played disproportionate bets in terms of emerging market debt. Uh, variations. Uh, again, question of leverage. Bailed out. Many people failed to notice. Bailed out. They dropped the interest rates and laid the groundwork for the next boom on account of long-term capital management. Most people in Main Street didn't even realize that that was much of a thing. They don't know how much uh, the global financial system, particularly the US and the hedge fund and the banking system, were exposed due to the leverage on the derivative contracts through long-term capital management. And the interest rate cuts were such to reflect that and that it led to a boom in retail because retail weren't feeling it. We then had the dot-com bubble and bust again, deeper down. The real winners out of the internet boom were the statist names. All those that you now associate with the dark state, data capture, uh, your one world order retailer, Amazon, the likes of Google, etc., uh, etc. Et the small boo.coms, bridal.coms, they were not the stars of the future. They got crushed and wrecked. And even though Amazon ran up to well over $100 and back down to around six, uh, it's its story now, the story of legend in terms of capture, a bottomless overdraft. They ran losses and losses for more than decades uh, and continued to capture the online retailer space, the server space for AWS, along with uh, the likes of the rest of the oligopoly, uh, later to catch up with them, Microsoft uh, and to some degree Apple. Uh, housing then was the next boom. Uh, again, tiny bit less highs. Uh, over there, but subsequent even greater smash. Now, you, the interesting thing is this is Bank of America Global Research, and this chart is done as per, I expect, Mr. Hartnett, um, an employee of a bank. There was no bubble drawn for the savings and loans crisis of the early 80s. There was a banking crisis, a bubble and crash. And the subprime, they're naming housing as the bubble, but it was actually a bubble of financial engineering. In short, since the fiat era came in, where gold went up, not on account of it being a bubble, but gold went up on account of the devaluation of true money and the failure of linkage of a uh, piece of paper to a securitizable asset such as gold. It was no longer backed by gold. And as a result of that, it became a faith-based system. During this era, every, I want to say every, not actually everyone, most of the highs got higher and higher in overvaluation due to the proliferation of financial engineering. Lending for everything was the new grand game. And fiat currency no longer required an ounce of gold to back it behind. Or even the pretense of some gold behind some 
of the fiat. <laughs> that whole pretense was removed. So what did we end up having? We had an era of absolute financial engineering that started from the end of what was described as a gold bubble and has largely ended now. This has been the era of the search for yield. The search for yield. Ever higher house prices paying lower rents relative to valuation, a reduced yield. Bond prices going up, 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 up and up. And remember our saying, if you're the first time on our channel, we called the end of the bond bull market at the events of March 2020. In short, never again in our view will debt have such a high value and pay such a low yield. And at the same time, it coincided with the gold-silver ratio at an ever highest rate of around 128 uh, ounces of silver to secure one ounce of gold. Um, so in our view, that is the bookmark end to the Falker era. Falker in the late uh, 70s into the early 80s, commencing the early 80s, boom. 40 years later, 2020, you have the end of your financialization of everything era on the chart that you are looking at, the blue brackets that is capturing this entire period. That's right. So what next, you say? Now, this is also part and parcel of what was the great Greenspan era that's uh, bridled the 1987 crash, which is roughly when he came in, very early in the beginning of this era over there, just past the 86 number, and was the man who proliferated and dropped rates at any sign of pain. The no pain macro economy. That is correct. During this period, he had the tailwind of globalization of everything. Offshoring, offshoring, offshoring. The manufacture of clothes, food, everything. Prices stayed stubbornly stable. He spoke of a productivity miracle as dot-com employees went to work with, in casual short days with their sparrow, budgie, and their dog all on a perch chatting to them while they worked. This was the era of the great productivity miracle. Thanks to uh, that, yes, indeed, Mr. Greenspan, we'll see you in the Truth and Reconciliation Committee for the crimes, the economic crimes against all of global humanity. Of course, we also had the boomer generation in the most significant nation that was also the base currency of the globe, the dollar, being it's at its demographic fullest. The greatest contribution to tax taxation actually saw a Democrat, Bill Clinton, return a surplus despite his best efforts to throw money, good money after bad. Uh, when the boomer was at his tax most efficient, the largest economic contribution, 47 years old. And today, my friends, they are now peak retirement. Peak retirement. So we're on the worst side of the demographics in terms of the boomer, the pig in the Python era. We are on the, the financialization of everything that is now over. Debt to have stubbornly high interest rates, even during periods of great recession. Hence why we refer to hyper stagflation. The worst variety of the 70s, far more aggressive, stubbornly high interest rates, even when you drop it. Why? Too much debt, too much proliferation, looking at earning a guaranteed negative yield to a much higher level of inflation as we bifurcate back down the globalization, all coinciding with a negative demographic, all coinciding with credit contraction in an environment where rates stay stubbornly high, consumers can afford less. That's right. Now we talk about consumers. While we are observing this era, the era, the six months of light on the North Pole and the six months of darkness that await you, the, the six months of summer and the six months of winter that await you. Yes, what does it take shape as? Well, in our opinion, markets do not go up quite like they go down. What happens when things go down is it generally gets very, very disorderly. Uh, in short, you will, uh, capturing a short that falls is often a much quicker trade than a long grinding bull that continues to work its way up with occasional corrections. So that means in time frame, it may not be the, the metaphor of six months but it will be far more violent and far more contractionary. And during that contraction, an intervention will occur by your ever-saving 
statist government, friends, who will bring about a new system. There is an earthquake to be encountered, and you need to arc the crevasse so that you do not fall in, moving from middle classdom into plebeiscence, plebeiscence, peasantry, and serfdom. Let's just stay with that as you fall down the crevasse that is going to be the booby trap waiting for you in a disorderly corrective market. Now, it's also important to note as we look at these bubbles, a couple of other key macro points that we have consistently made across all our content that is beautifully highlighted. We said that China went into mega debt overdrive mode and began to build buildings and buildings and empty cities. During the period, they were dovetailed to generate heat in the global economy post a real full-blown depression. The depression was that of the subprime crisis that is being blamed on housing that should actually be blamed on the banking cartel, easy lending standards, ridiculously low interest rates, asset bubbles in other words, asset inflation. There was inflation, just not at the till, nearly as much as in asset prices. The search for yield in terms of rental, uh, in terms of bond markets, etc., etc. Ridiculously low interest rates brought to you by your central banking cartel, uh, robo signing of mortgages, uh, the ninja loans, all forms of perversions of normal auditing standards. In short, it was all about the sales of mortgage and the collateralization of that mortgage debt into assets that allowed to pay a slightly higher yield because the borrowers were subprime, hence the subprime crisis. But the original originators of those loans, they were not keeping those fraught loans that they were putting out to ninja people. They were getting repackaged and falsely stamped as A-plus quality debt and unsold to other banks, including pan-European banks, which were the Swiss and the Germans as some of the dumbest banks in the land, buying this higher yielding asset class later to become greatly devalued as Detroit burned, turned back into slums, and people that were promised the home ownership dream and couldn't afford it sold reset mortgages and promised that after two years on their discount window, they would be able to refinance again at another discount and release capital. Only problem, the asset no longer qualified for higher valuation. The music stopped, ergo the big short and everything you remember about that event. That's right, my friends. That was a financial crisis. It was, in fact, a global depression, particularly for the Western world, the Western Hemisphere particularly. Uh, the definition for a global depression, many people don't know. One of the key definitions that, and there's not one universally agreed one, so it's even harder than recession, where it's two quarters, unless, of course, the Fed changes the rules. The labor market's so strong, red-hot labor market on our non-farm payrolls birth death model and other lies. Um, but let's set that one aside. The uh, Great Depression uh, is two years of negative growth, for which Britain had one quarter where they recorded 0.1, thanks to a bit of QE and a help yourself along number, and typically financial system failure. Two years, that's eight quarters of negative growth. And banking failure is your official depression uh, definition. That definitely happened in the housing market. If it wasn't already a a possible on the internet.com boom, it definitely happened subprime. And as a result, the, glo- the world was on its knees through 09, 10, 11, and 12. Many will remember what, how hard and dour and scratchy and scrapey that uh, economic environment was. Uh, we had QE1, QE2, QE3, QE4, a little bit of twist, a little bit of not QE, a little bit of everything. Uh, but let me tell you, the total numbers of all those QEs still significantly lag that which was released on the events of March 2020 that gave the pumper mentals to the R over here. Let me use pink instead. Transgender pink, why not? The whole world is turning pink. Transgender pink and of course Bitcoin. that got their run-ups during those periods on trillions this time. Multiple trillions. No one can agree how many. Five, six, seven. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? What's a trillion there and a trillion here? I mean, I lose that behind the couch just when I sit down and watch some cheeky Netflix with some transgenders. Uh, But anyway, uh, we digress. So what's actually happened since is that the bubbles that have occurred since 
of very much of a status-based nature. I'm going to return to that, but I'm going to park that concept for a while. So China was made to generate heat and was the echo bubble to keep the world turning. It's one of the reasons why Australia had the lightest of it all. Um, in fact, they hardly had a serious correction in their property market, so they've had a double expansion. Copper, ores, everything was required from good old Australia, and they were shipping it all to China, and China was building buildings that now have crumbling balconies, uh, are empty, some of which are being destroyed, some of which, my friends, some of which the owners are still awaiting their apartments and got deposits, and they haven't even started the site and build. That's right, the story of Evergrande, the quickest from very low levels of debt to hyper indebtedness that you'd ever seen. In short, they made what the subprime crisis look like child's play, but they created heat for a while. But then the Shanghai Accord in 2016 to highlight uh, the extent of the crash that was occurring in the Chinese market by then. In the meantime, we'd had a biotech rally uh, and all these industries, biotech, so let's just summarize biotech, biotech, Big Pharma related, uh, essentially the seed part of Big Pharma in many instances, uh, life extension, many other aspects like that. Um, ARC, very much the et metaverse and the future. Uh, she, of course, to me, is a female version of Elon Musk, only not a car company. Um, she identifies with him. A lot of her early growth was on Tesla Holdings. That's another bottomless overdraft that got subsidies and looked after. There's some entrepreneurs, they don't seem to have to apply to the same rules as someone like you and I. Bezos and Musk are very much them. They have the Rockefeller overdraft and you write checks and checks and checks. As long as you dominate that market, no one asks for the return. You keep going, you keep going, you keep spending, you keep growing, you keep expanding until you are a scale, scale player. Let's not forget that Tesla as a vehicles company is worth more than Toyota and many other European makers that have been in the space generating real earnings for far, far longer and don't receive any subsidies uh, from California or any other place. Anyway, so such is the nature. I refer to these later bubbles very much as the statist bubbles. Every single here uh, aspect, every single market here is one that should concern you. It is the weaponization. It is the military industrial complex without the guns. It is in some senses medical weaponization, transgender weaponization, metaverse weaponization, uh, data weaponization, when we talk about Facebook, uh, Google, uh, servers and everything. It is your privacy and surveillance. This is the anti-industries that absolutely feed on the dandruff that falls off your hair. These are the parasites that are grabbing every single aspect of your metadata, your health and everything else. And who is funding this? The people that have now created the mass psychosis event. This entire era is in essence a mass psychosis event. Why? Because we no longer are on sound money. We took a tangent and we went into fantasy. You are in essence in a Matrix movie. That's right. You took a new journey. You've gone down a rabbit hole where fiat is king and debt is king. Until, of course, it isn't. And this super cycle has seen the particular industries that are required, including Bitcoin, which is, of course, getting many trained for the on-ramp of central bank digital tokens amongst those, in much the same way in, uh, during the internet boom, we established the seed of the resurgence and phoenixing of Apple, uh, only now is a lot more darker in intent, although it may have been dark from the beginning, who knows, Google and Amazon as the winners. So in the crypto revolution, we have the likes of Ripple, we have HBAR, we have Lumen, we have Ethereum with their status-based intentions uh, as well for putting your property on the blockchain. And anybody can buy at any time if you understate the value. That's right, a Chicago pre professor along with good old Vitalik who probably didn't know too much about that conversation or what he was agreeing to. Uh, either that or is totally controlled like many others. These are weaponized status that may as well say military industrial complex. Every boom thereafter is for 
the opulent classes to assert control on the mass peasantry. Let me state again, the opulent class that is coming, remember the polarization of wealth, the destruction of the middle, the opulent classes are coming and the industries that they own and are participating in as part of the priest class, the ruling classes, due to their supremacy to you, uh, are actually where they are building their wealth. You are the sheep and they are the farmer and they are farming you. Indeed, 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 my friends. Uh, and every single one of those fall into that category of weaponization against the citizenry. You are the mark. So let's move on a little bit and leave the bubbles. I hope that was interesting for you. Um, that is my framing. These aren't independent bubbles with just assets that popped. Gold stood still. Fiat was the devaluation. And everything else since has been the unbridled, unlimited, no longer attached to backing paper confetti. In short, this is the fantasy. You have been living in the 40-year fantasy financialization of everything of unbacked money. And that unbacked money has allowed those that are considering themselves as the ruling class to weaponize certain industries and create pumps and create extreme wealth for which they will turn that fiat into hard assets in many cases, but create and establish industries that can have dominant oligopolist positions over the citizenry and their ability to leak data and information to intelligence bureaus, to tax collectors, to compliance law and many things else. So let's go into this opulence class a tiny bit more uh, and also the Gini curve generally. In fact, um, I'm going to show you, let's stay with uh, the snagged images over here. I'm going to show you uh, the Gini curve. And this is actually as a pie diagram, so let's have a look at that. Uh, and this is a chat, as I said, I did with a private group um, yesterday morning. And this is the global wealth spread wealth distribution this is in the united states uh, specifically uh, but you will not find it to be extremely different in many other parts of say europe uh, uk etc etc so the opulence classes as i've chosen to label them are the 0.1 and then i've gone right down to the 90 percent i say right down the top 10 percent of global wealth in other words by people the top 10 percent of people how much of the, glo the global wealth, the 90s to 100s, how much of global wealth do they hold? They hold over 68%. This is them in a pie diagram. That pink right there, all the way around, is global wealth. And I highlight this key point that I highlighted to the private group I was discussing this with earlier on uh, the previous day, is that this is on official numbers which are invariably lies. What real wealth do you see as the number for the Rothschild Rockefeller clan and in their foundations. You can find nothing about that. There is nothing but lives, subterfuge, cross ownerships, uh, foundations, owning foundations, owning corporations across geographies, across cross holdings. There is no way to truly tell and it will greatly understate the true skew of global wealth and media will not touch it because they are owned there too to not illustrate that. So in short, there's trillionaires you don't know about that aren't being captured in this number. This is off official statistics. It's like me presenting on inflation using the BLS stats and not mentioning shadow stats or real inflation experiences, anecdotes or real numbers that you might be experiencing that are well beyond that that they are telling you. In the same way, I want you to view these well stats. Let's pretend this is the best case for the Gini curve. Serfs and peasants coming in, naught to 90% of the people, naught to 90% of the people, the bottom half of people, that is 50% of the US citizenry, own 3%. That little green slice of pizza pie that if you came around to my house and I cut you a slice of cake or pizza that small, you'd be offended, my friends. You'd be deeply offended. You're not getting a meal. You're barely getting a taste. That is the fact of it. And that goes for half the guests in the house. You're kidding me. No siree. And then the next from 50% to 90, that's the other 40 apart from the top 10, 
and you're looking at sub 30 percent that's in the orange now many of you will be bridging on the high end here and the low end of the supreme area and i'm here to tell you much like i'm showing with this blue line this is going to get smaller it already is in my opinion a lot smaller and it's going to keep squeezing in short the opulence classes for every middle class person that is destroyed and is a forced seller of a leveraged home on an interest rate spike or uh, other assets shaken out other taxations that he's not got protection from westernized nations overreaching etc etc he is going to get poorer this portion of the top 90 percent is going to continue to shorten and this line is going to sweep across this way you have to make sure that you stay on this side of the line or you get there if you're not already there that is one of the most critical things this is your wealth genie curve in a single diagram according to their stats which I question uh, on, a, on the grounds of cross holdings and true, uh, true mega families are not being reflected in the manner in which they truly hold wealth via assets such as Vanguard, BlackRock and many others. Okay, so that is the wealth. Just to give you a little idea of someone who crossed over to the opulence classes, by the way, um, I, mention, I mention him because he's probably the biggest sellout uh, you could probably ever account. Bono becomes the world's richest pop star after investment in Facebook. You see, you start playing the game, you start playing the agenda. Popular icons that can uh, work with the statist agenda will get invited to early investments in Facebook pre-listing. I recall the Facebook listing. It listed for a hundred billion, which was considered by the greediest investment bank in the world, known as the Vampire Squid, Goldman Sachs, as a stretchy valuation to reach for. He wanted the technical number. It was one of the biggest IPOs, 100 billion. And of course, the price uh, languished for quite an extended period thereafter. But eventually, all those forward sold, monopolist data harvesting. Uh, expectations of future revenue flows did in fact come in and now today of course it is significantly more valuable but had you bought on the IPO listing you would have sat a very very dark spell out of course Bono was given a red carpet to prior listing in fact he set up an investment company and held 2.3 percent him very self in a social media network I wonder what uh, singing in the band U2 actually prepared him for venture capital investment. I wonder which whisperers were giving him a wee hand in an advisory capacity uh, on a sure thing if he could only find a couple uh, a million to pop in. Of course he put in 56 million pounds round about then at the time and the overall value then went well through 940 million. Uh, he would have sold some I'm sure on the open but if he's still holding them it's gone on significantly further. Significantly further. You see if you play the game if you play the game you get to feast with the cartel indeed 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 a uh, couple of things on the uh, stocks and earnings so this bifurcation line of thought that I've been giving you is you need to think about the world in terms of two clients the priestly opulent classes and the peasantry and serfs People are looking here at the big seven monopolistic UK tech corporations and they see stocks up 61% this year so far, trading on a 30 price earnings. So the seven monopolistic tech have a very bright future according to the market. And actually, I assess they do, unfortunately. The rest of the market sitting on 17 and the US is probably one of the most costly by earnings multiple markets of them all. Mass size, mass liquidity used to be rule of law, fast diminishing. There will be PE adjustment for that in due course in time, I am sure. Um, and now you have not the technological side, but the luxury. Who feeds the opulent classes their toys? Well, good old Europe. Good old Europe, the motherland of control over America, many believe, from the UK particularly. 36 times earnings 
on the 600, the stock 600, which is the closest equivalent to the S&P 500 European equities market, their average non-superstar is a 12 PE, a far lesser rated. Too socialist a nation, you say. Good old capitalist USA. Well, I don't know so much. But anyway, that is one third of the 36X. And who do we find in the 36X? Well, let's just cover that for you. Luxury, the opulence classes, LVMH. This is my friend Louis Vuitton, uh, Hermes, and many of the other top-end brands, all clustered together. Our very own Rupert of South Africa, a massive investor from his Richmond, oh, also appearing down here, cigarettes holding company that sold Rothmans Daniels into South Africa. He bought all the brands. He bought uh, deeply into those. Uh, then you have Christian Dior, Hermes in its own, L'Oreal, Kering, and Ferrari. Wow. So these guys are trading at a 36x, that is three times the average equity in that market. How is the market pricing such huge optimism for these equities going forward and they're so pessimistic the rest? Because there's two groups of people, my friends. The bifurcation of the global supply chain, the bifurcation of the global population. The 2017 video you watched with me on Greenwich Hill talking to you about exactly this point. The middle classes will be de uh, devastated into an opulence class that will own almost everything and a crushed retail serfdom that will be on UBI. And we are going to continue to see the re-ratings according to a segregated world. A segregated world of extreme wealth versus UBI serfdom. That is correct. That is how you get PEs and that's how you value them. The temptation by many and possibly in this article is short these high PEs and long these lower PEs. And to that I say no. In the same way I said to Mr. Druckenmiller, be careful the shorts on Tesla if you do not have a setup, a pattern. We have got away with one short and we've got away with one long on Tesla. If you do not have a structure, a target and a pattern, which HVF method gives you, which you can learn from us below, first link in the description, click, book a call, learn and get wiser, watch us implement it. Or if you just go short on fundamentals, you will run into the Rothschild Rockefeller overdraft of all overdrafts that powered Amazon into decades of losses, yet coming out an absolute captured online retailer, one of the largest uh, AWS server providers that now has, amazingly, the military industrial complex itself as its clients. They have no shortage of money, as I've already mentioned, and they are weaponized against you. And they are the weaponized protection of a failing fiat system. They are the last bastion force, my friends. And the ability to force is the last bastion for a failing system as the rule of common law and behavior is already whittling and fraying at the edges. The military industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industrial co complex, the gender uh, changing industrial complex transformation, um, the uh, all of these forces that are working against you that are held by the mega corps and are weaponized against citizen, and this sees the opulence crowd do what they will do. By the way. The opulence crowd don't think twice to buy this 4x4 Ferrari, a gratuitous opportunity to put a fancy sports car in my video. Um, these, by the way, somewhere between 400 and 500,000 euros and you haven't really fully spec them yet. Uh, and you can blow a grand, 100 grand, 150 grand in specking, uh, sure as nuts. And these people do not think about the service intervals, do not worry about the drop in resale value. This is a, a beacon of their esteemed establishment as ruling class, a toy for kings. That's right. And that is what you get out of these luxury brands that will be sold into the opulent billionaires of the tech 
oligarchy, who in turn will be providing services to the luxury makers, uh, and you will be making these products for them and driving your scooter home and collecting your UBI. So, with all that said, now we understand there's a polarization in the global uh, realm in terms of potential earnings, wealth, and income. What are the great trades? What are the great trades as we look at uh, these Ferraris? Just by having the money to buy one doesn't mean it would make a good decision, by the way. And we say we listen to Martin, we listen to Armstrong, we listen to Stanley Druckenmiller. And the one thing that was notable was that they were great inspirational speakers, they were interesting people, and there was very little offered in terms of how to position for your wealth building. In fact, uh, whilst seeking to remain humble, and Stanley Druckenmiller is the master of being a mega billionaire, but being the self-depreciating, super humble, with a twinkle in his eye, lovely man. We all fall in love with his personality. And I say to you, find 10 reasons to hate the man that you so seek to love, uh, who is a force of personality, but is he a force of character? Um, the concerning points for me when I think of Stanley Druckenmiller is his commitment to the green agenda. And then his use of Israel as, look how well they've done on no resources compared to the Arabian countries with resources, while quietly brushing through uh, a slow motion genocide of the Palestinian people, uh, the fact that they received disproportionate aid from America, and the fact that they probably robbed steep and steal all technology, and many of the American corporations declare themselves to be more Israeli than American intel, for one, as an example. So I have problems with his morality, despite his immense charm, the twinkle in his eye, and his humility about all that he's achieved. He is, of course, the partner of George Soros that got the nod on the Bank of England bust, uh, and he played with scale and had no shortage of leverage when he felt he was in a sure thing. Almost like Bono on Facebook, you might wonder. Yes, so while he's so easy to love, should you really love him? Did he offer me anything in terms of how I should be positioning and trading? Not a great deal. Blessings be to our uh, other guest, Martin Armstrong, who came on. Really nice to talk to him. This is a man who was persecuted, did repeated, repeated contempt of court jail time for apparently, according to him, not surrendering his model that had gained him such great acclaim and the ear of leaders, top leaders, Greenspan in the room, advising China on economic policy, etc., 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 to then later being criminalized uh, for an investment company gone wrong. I'm not here to cast a view, uh, but I have great empathy for him. Um, but also, currently, in terms of what to do and how to position, very, very little to say. And I say to those that I spoke to uh, earlier in our community and also again in a closed group as a, as a trial uh, presentation for this YouTube, there are things that are going to move. Stanley Druckenmiller said, it is one of the most difficult markets to call. He has so little to say. After lots of long, amazing anecdotes and cheery chat, the crunch came to very little in terms of how to position. Now, there's a couple of things. They may not want to tell you exactly how they want to position. It may get them in trouble. Or they just don't really see what we seem to see. So this brings me back to a thread I left open on Japan. Japan, Japan, Japan. Ah, let's turn to Japan. Here we have the yen. We have the yen and we have the debt markets of Japan. Now, we were known for calling uh, the long over here from 109s, 110 zone and saying you shall surpass 139 on the yen. Let's go for a monthly chart and get a little bit. And that we have faced a turn of all turns for the yen. And this is a very important point. I'm going to take that eye off for a while and highlight something. When you split this screen, when you split the screen um, and you add the Nikkei to this, the eventual lows for the Nikkei and the eventual lows for the Japanese yen all coincided at roughly the same time. So let me pull this chart in for you. So here you have the Nikkei. The Nikkei went to 38,900. 
The bottoming, the bottoming period of the Nikkei occurred during the subprime crisis. 2009, this was the sell-off. And during this period, the dollar was never more low against the Japanese yen. Down, 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 she did go. We had uh, inverted structure over here, very flat bottomed. A squeezy, squeezy, that Japanesey, and so you did spill, spill, spill. In fact, we shorted the USD JPY, which means short dollar long the yen, just prior to the Fukushima earthquake to attain an amazing outcome on a wick, that wick right there, to, to target before a subsequent rally, only for it to go a touch lower. During that period, Abe. A long shot came back into power and the three arrows policy came into being under his financial minister. And from then on, we have seen nothing but devaluation for the currency. And it was also the bottom of the Nikkei. And from then on, despite uh, some pullbacks along the way, we have seen largely nothing but increases in the value of the Nikkei. So the Bank of Japan has chosen, post the lows of the dot-com bull uh, bear and the Chinese creating all the heat till 2016 in the global economy, Japan chose their currency to be the release valve. We saw this trade, the structural setup over here. We said to many to trade long, our community traded long, and you would have got out at 138. It died at 150. It died at 150 before pulling back. That, of course, was peak dollar, and we were at 114 plus on the dollar index, and we had a stark and harsh pullback on the dollar, and so the USD JPY rested too during that period. But what I wanted to show you is how the new government and the new policies saw the pivot in the change. What ails the currency, you might ask? Well, for that, we have to look at the debt markets. And this, many people don't realize, as being a seminal factor of everything. The debt markets. You see, the Japanese are approaching 300%. Many have had them at around 280% uh, on the debt markets uh, to GDP. So that's percentage of debt to GDP. We actually had a small trade uh, on this to the upside. I didn't take it. Uh, we drew it. It was a bit disproportional. We said we're going to go from near zero values all the way up to half a percent. Now that is actually, in percentage terms, massive because it was only just positive. But in terms of moving from something that's barely over zero to 0 0.5, it may not sound like much. Since then, we have pulled back very hard and we've been bouncing around that little unwelcome bit of volatility that actually saw a high of 0.593 on the tenure, one of the most common debt instruments, is in fact uh, highlighting that it was most unwelcome, that level of change. Imagine what that does for their interest rate payments on their debt market going up from there. And to be clear, in a world where you have a country where more adults crap in nappies than kids, in a country that is no commodities broadly and imports oil and many other ores and commodities to make their products their inflation level can only be a statistical aberration if it does not come close to the single di the double digits mark uh, and you'll be no doubt surprised that japanese inflation regularly is measured a la the bls tactics of change the basket, remove all basis of comparison, structure in something that is actually contracting for something that is expanding, etc., etc. They say lies, damn lies, then statistics. The Japanese inflation rate, in lieu of a collapsing currency that has to buy commodities in dollar-based prices, clearly understates the level of inflation that is there. So how is the debt market being sustained? Well, you see, there is a bidder, there is a buyer, him of nearly bottomless pockets, the Bank of Japan itself. The Bank of Japan is the one that is applying. And you saw Hartnett in the Zero Hedge article talk about the Fed needing to do yield curve control. The Bank of Japan is like 11 years ahead, only its bubble came 25 years ahead. 
uh, America. They are implementing yield curve control because that controls the value of the debt of all their pensioners. All that money in those giddy years, the wives were buying the safe investment, that which their government provided paying a low but certain yield. That's right, my friends. The women and the housewives of Japan have been stacking Japanese bonds. As a result, as a result, you have a retirement demographic that is deeply buried in debt as its asset class for its pension in an environment where that same government must sustain that value to avoid all pensions from collapse. This is something that will be reset when the earthquake strikes in the disorderly descent of the future debt market's destruction. Pause for dramatic effect. The debt market destruction. That's right. That's right, my friends. The debt market is oversupplied, hyper overvalued, and it comes from the era of the search for yield. Keep paying ever higher capital prices for ever smaller yield to the point that you are now locking in guaranteed negative yields to your true inflation rate. Now we end with March 2020, that era, that great era for debt, and we now find ourselves in the capital preservation era, where preserving capital will see you far outperform any concern around yield in what is a negative yield return environment on hyper-valued, over-financialized, over-leveraged uh, assets. As I explained through the mega booms that occurred. So, how does this adjust? It adjusts through the currency. The currency will be allowed to decline. They will print more and they will support the bond market more. They will keep proliferating yen to support the bond markets and yen will devalue. And this is the trade that Stanley can't find for you, that others have no vision for, but we do. And we want to remain humble because we could always be wrong. But I see trades. I see trades. The Nikkei that is stuffed with international makers of core products we have in our community a number of macro corporations that are exporters with small domestic markets but will earn dollars yuan and ruble more than they will earn yen in a tailwind yen environment you see my friends the power behind the nikkei will eventually see the nikkei not only make new highs in devalued yen but go well beyond we have a 57,000 target on a head and shoulders as you can see complex head and shoulders as taught to you by HVF method as put in practice by me and many other community members as implementing HVF method in the markets practically live for you to see and watch that's right we triggered on this 20,000 nick line some time ago back in 2017 since the turn in the Nikkei that ended with the turn, wait for it, in the yen. We did show this to you, my friends. So the tailwind in your Nikkei is, in fact, the yen. But therein lies the catch. Don't sell dollars by uh, the big macro uh, corporations, industrial corporations in yen, because you take away your gain on the currency. You need options. You need CFDs. You want to trade the upside of the index without getting to where the reduction of the downside of the currency and what a downside to that currency you will gain. This will continue in this inverted head and shoulder and our expectation is for the 57,000 as we have already illustrated to you on the Nikkei index. By the way, inside of that index are specific individual companies. Apart from one that I've mentioned in a previous YouTube, you can come into our community and find our favorites. Uh, that is something for you to go and to find out. Uh, and we are, using HVF method, finding our favorites and who we like for longs. In short, you can trade individual corporations or the overall uh, index. Some of those individual corporations will outperform to the upside. The greater they export, I'm giving you more clues than you care for. Uh, 
the greater they earn other currencies uh, instead of the yen to their domestic market, the better they will do. And if they're dominant position players that turn out quality products, which many Japanese corporations do, uh, so you will find that they will do exceedingly well. This in an environment where debt is going to do exceedingly badly. Uh, not yet implementing yield curve control is something we've mentioned before, the TLT, and we called for the turning of the bond market. So what else have we said to you? We called for it in that same year of 2020, around about August, we said that uh, inverted HVF will break down and make a target that will uh, coalesce with that neckline. You'll probably get a rally, which you did, and then you will sell off to target to the downside. That was the beginning of a reversal where you've only made the head and shoulders target. This is a secular reversal in this asset class that will go most of the way to zero before being transformed into something else that will obscure and muddy the water. UBI, Fed coin, token of choice, greatly devalued by the time you work it out and you get a basis of comparison that is similar to the original basis and realize you will have taken an even bigger loss than you cared to know. Hence, the short of the likes of TLT is probably one of your best trades. There's a triple top right there for you to see after making its target, almost necklining on our legacy target, and we expect further downside. So, as many may think, but, 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 demand-destroying event, surely there's going to be a bid and a rush to debt. Much less so than you think there's more of it around. They've added disproportionately, remember all those booms getting ever higher and taller? Those were built on an ever exponential parabola of debt proliferation. They no longer can do it. They've now had the inflationary effect uh, that has brought it in. You're going to have stubbornly high inflation, my friends, that will not go down nearly as easy despite the pain on the peasant and serf class. Remember, the opulent ones have more money than they need. The worse the circumstances, the better they do. Remember, in times of war, you die and they get rich. This is the great dichotomy. This is the as above, so below. This is the world as you will see it. This is hard facts, my friends. This debt market is not yet begun. It's true descent. And somewhere in the journey of that, later to become even more unruly descent, will be the earthquake that sets the UBI, the replacement to your pensions, and everything else that they've been planning for you in the central bank digital token space, uh, the universal basic income space, and everything else. In short, your six months of nights will be six weeks of sheer hell interrupted by an earthquake. Merry Christmas! I told you, I'm full of good news. Guess what? You can actually benefit from that and you can transcend all the noise, but you're going to have to take a lot of steps. You're going to have to be on the right side of the market. You start by clicking that link, the very first one, in the description below and booking a call. You can build wealth in reset times. I am the John the Baptist for the Great Reset. I named it before they stole our name. We named it. Uh, we've been at it. We've warned you about oil collapses uh, just prior to the events of March 2020. Uh, we have said to you that gold and precious metals are certainly one of the few longs and there are others. However, the rest is for the community. You can join if you've enjoyed this presentation below. But we are warning you, dead down, occasional rallies on demand destroying events, but generally down, yields up. There could be the possibility, and this came out of the Zero Hedge article, that you could see 6% before 3, said Hartnett. And whilst a small pullback in rates will get everyone calling top, or a small pause may even be enough to get everyone calling top, they will call top too soon in the exact same way they call bottoms too soon. They will call tops too soon on interest rates. Debt must go uh, up in yield until such time as it is unfathomable, unsupportable, and leads to the earthquake event of a new system. That is our predictions. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Don't forget to like and share um, and give us a thumbs up as you sign out. Until next time, we look forward to entertaining you further. Bye for now.